This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is Twim, This Week in Microbiology, episode 281, recorded on February 2nd, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello, where it's a beautiful, bright, sunny winter day where the snow is glistening. The snow is glistening. You have snow on the ground. Yeah, we probably have five inches. Wow. We have a quarter of an inch. Mm. <laughs> and it's cold. I don't know if it's sunny. I can't see out the window. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. We have a gray and gloomy 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And yesterday it was 83 degrees in Chamber of Commerce weather, but wow. today we're back wow. to winter. You, do you ever get snow there? Uh, once every so often, and it's typically on a 10 year cycle. So we last had our <laughs> snow a few years ago. It was before COVID. I'm everything is BC now in my mind before COVID after COVID. Also joining us from St. Louis, Missouri, Petra Levin. It's good to be here. We have, uh, just tiny bits of snow left from our quarter inch. We had two snow days in a week period for uh, kids in elementary and high school, you know, the school district. And uh, neither time would it have been called in Michigan for sure. Or the mm -hmm. Northeast. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, but the kids loved it, right? Um, I think the first one they loved, but they couldn't play in the snow because it, it there was no snow to play in. The first yeah. one was mostly water, which got pushed around by plows, oddly. And the second one, it was kind of a little bit slippery, but really only a quarter inch. So yeah, that's not, not much. A, no, no. Not enough to call, I think. Oh, well. They're getting easier and easier calling snow days, it seems. <laughs> I think we only have one plow for the entire St. Louis County. <laughs> well, today we are back with some microbial education for you. And uh, Michelle's going to start us off with a really powerful paper. <laughs> <laughs> no pun yes. intended. And the title is Biosynthesis of Polycyclopropanated High Energy Biofilms. And it was published in July in the journal Jewel. And that's not Jewel as in a gem, but rather a unit of energy. And it is from um, a number of scientists uh, led by Jay Kiesling at Berkeley. But the authors include Pablo Cruz Morales, Kevin Yin, Alexander Landera, John Court, Robert Young, Jennifer Kyle, Robert Bertrand, Anthony Ivoroni, Sunil Achira, Aden Cohen, Yan Chen, Jennifer Ginn, Corinne Scown, Christopher Petzold, Carolina Arujo Borsalas, Eric Sundstrom, Ethi Gorge, Young Song Lee, Sarah Kloss, Alberta Nava, and Jay Kiesling. And they are focused on generating biosynthetically high energy density fuels. And these are the fuels that we need for to run our rockets and our jets and also um, our shipping industry. And if you think about it, this makes sense because the more power that every drop of fuel packs, the less you'd need to carry. And that makes the process more efficient. So they're looking for really high energy density fuels. And the um, polycyclopropanated in the title refers to the structure um, that they will be uh, working with. And these are rather than like if you think of a, a hexagon that makes up glucose, for example, six carbon rings, these are three carbon rings, and because the angles are so tight, they're under a lot of strain, which means when they're broken, they release a lot of heat. So that is why these um, cyclopropanes have been previously demonstrated to pack a lot of punch. And in fact, there is a synthetic fuel called Sintin that was derived from petroleum that 
has these um, three-member cyclopropane rings. So there was precedent for um, the value of these as a um, fuel source. So their goal was to to basically come up with um, biosynthetic fuels so that we don't have to um, harvest fossil fuels, and which is expensive and it damages a lot of um, beautiful uh, terrain across the globe. So what they've done is turn to microbes and in particular looked in their genomes for pathways that are known to generate these three ring structures. And there was a precedent for this in the literature. Um, Previously, it had been published um, that a streptomyces species um, can generate molecules with multiple cyclopropane rings. And in particular, that molecule is called jazamycin. So in figure one, they um, actually give us a really nice introduction to this chemistry and also um, provide the history of this field and the punchline for the paper. They, they show the um, new cyclopropanated high-energy biofuels that they've discovered and biosynthesized, which they call fuelomycins. So the approach they took was, um, again, based on the literature, they knew that, that a streptomyces species made one of these um, high-energy compounds biosynthetically, jaws of mycin. So they use the DNA sequence of the known enzymes that generate that molecule um, to query a database to look for other biosynthetic pathways in the microbial world that have not yet been discovered but could be used as tools to generate these. And what they found is um, some 19 new uh, biosynthetic gene clusters that were predicted to encode um, these structures based on um, their use of a particular enzyme that makes these. And it's um, it's not surprising that 17 of them were actually in the Streptomyces uh, genus. So old time, or many of the microbiologists listening to us will know that streptomyces is uh, really well known for generating a lot of um, small molecules that we've put to use, either as uh, medicines or pigments or food flavorings. So they, they live out in nature in the soil, and they use these secondary metabolites, they're called, not to directly fuel their own metabolism, but rather to interact with other uh, microbial species in the environment. So they might be competitors or comrades. So the other advantage of the streptomyces, um, besides this precedent of having a large pool of these uh, secondary metabolites, is it's also just a terrific organism to genetically engineer. So there's a lot of tools available for manipulating its genome, including a database of all the known secondary metabolites called the anti-smash database. So um, they have got some terrific um, starting points for their quest to generate a better tomorrow by um, harnessing microbes to make fuels. <laughs> Even the Disney World, she must have been. <laughs> yeah. I'm so break into song soon. <laughs> So here they're going to characterize one of these biosynthetic gene clusters from a streptomyces species. And in particular, they're going to focus on four core enzymes, which are known to generate this chain of three-member rings. So first what they did is um, got their hands on this particular species, and it's streptomyces alba reticula reticuli, um, and just grew a culture of it, and then analyzed its fatty acid profile profile, but no eureka here. They found nothing um, in the cultures. So they imagined that probably the secondary metabolite is not going to be made when the bacterium is happily growing in media, but it's probably only made in response to particular environmental clues. So they then turned to um, E. coli. Let's express it there. We can manipulate its, its expression. So they were able to to uh, generate a strain of E. coli that successfully made each of these enzymes. But again, when they look for a product, either in vivo or in vitro with the purified enzymes, um, they had no luck. So they continued on. They decided instead of using E. coli as their vector for for, uh, expressing these um, genes, they turned to three different streptomyces strains that have been long used in the field so they're kind of the workhorse um, strains of uh, scientists. And they use three different media. 
And here they were successful. Um, they found a particular strain that when um, transformed with the, these um, biosynthetic gene cluster and cultured in two different media was um, making the product that they were after. So they named this um, strain POP31. And POP here stands for polypropanated. Where is it? Well, I'll come back to that. Anyway, they named it POP31. So they were able to use proteomics there and, um, in fact, detected the four biosynthetic enzymes that they had engineered it to express. And they analyzed um, the supernatant of, the, of a live culture by um, liquid chromatography. And lo and behold, they found um, four new products. And they've named these uh, fulamycin A, B, C, and D. Fulamycin, to emphasize its predicted function as a fuel, and also mycin to emphasize it comes from the streptomyces. They now want to verify that their strain is making what they think it's making. So they use uh, radioactive methyl carbon and culture the strain in that. And then they analyze the products, again, by uh, mass spec. And they're able um, then you, to use a suite of advanced nuclear uh, magnetic resonance techniques and also spectroscopy techniques to deduce the structure of these four fulamycin products. And that's, uh, those structures are shown in figure three. So their next challenge was to um, how, if, if this is actually going to be a viable um, fuel to uh, a sustainable biosynthetic fuel, we're going to need to increase the yield. So they next turned to their genetic engineering tools to um, optimize the expression of these four enzymes and hopefully the product. So, for example, they place, replaced the rare codons with codons known to be more commonly used so that the tRNA pools were not limiting. They also um, added an extra copy of the enzyme S-adenosylmethionine synthetase, or synthase, which is known to catalyze the ring formation. And they added um, an extra uh, copies of um, a couple other genes in the, in the pathway and from the native um, parent that they thought would increase the efficiency. And by doing these um, stepwise and comparing them to the parent cultures, they were um, fortunate that they were able to increase the yield by 22-fold. So clearly, um, there's some expertise here, and they are um, on the, a great trajectory. So the final steps were to ask, okay, we've got this product, we've got a pretty good yield. Now, um, is it actually, how, how does it compare to known fuels? Let's, let's actually measure a, a combustion measure, the heating value, and also the fuel density or vapor pressure. The bang for the buck. Yeah. Hmm. So they purified two of these fuel, uh, fuelicins, and then they esterified it um, because that is known to be um, critical, and that's where the term um, for these fuels, pop fames, comes from. These are pilot, pilo, polycyclopropanated fatty acid methyl esters. They purified those and then compared them directly to a number of um, fuels that, that are well known to us and, and are used in the industry. So, for example, ethanol, gasoline, jet fuels, and also Sintin, this previously uh, described synthetic fuel that also uses these so cyclopropanated rings, um, but it's made from um, petroleum. And Michelle, if, you, if the listeners will go to the first page of their article and their graphical abstract, the point that you are now coming to of the bang for the buck of these fuels is listed in that graphical abstract by the net heat of combustion from biodiesel, ethanol, biojet, gasoline, jet A, synthen. And then when you look at their fuels, they're almost off the top of the graph. It, it's one of the really cool graphical abstracts. It's beautiful. And since some of you may not be able to look at this article, the way you look at these polycyclopropanated fuels is consider them the, the spikes that your car drives over as you're going out of a parking deck. And if you back up, it explodes your tires. That's what these cycle propanated fuel structures look like. They look like parking spikes. 
And we know what parking spikes do to tires. They blow them up. And so that's effectively what this fuel does. It just blows up, expelling all of this potential energy for work. I I love this graphical abstract. It takes their key data figure, which is figure five, but then they um, add some other key elements to remind us this is coming from a microbial product because we're looking at bacterial colonies. And then they also have got um, schematics of a a jet and a a rocket. Um, But they're measuring on the... um, y-axis heat of combustion, and then on the x-axis density. So you want to be in the upper right-hand corner, and all of their fuelicins are further into the upper right corner than anything um, that is currently in use. And to put this into perspective, their scale is megajoules. And when they announced the Great Fusion Experiment, they only made 1.5 joules of energy. (laughs) 1.5 joules of energy and billions of dollars went into that experiment. And yet the lowly microbial world is making megajoules per liter uh, from polyketide biosynthesis. I I need another perspective because this is where I'm kind of having a little trouble, which is in terms of like, yeah, that's, amazing and the microbes are really amazing but in terms of like actual practical like using it for fuel how much are they getting in in like what is yeah to the author's credit they discuss this they now have to develop methods to scale up so that they can generate Mm -hmm. enough products product to um, do some of that next generation set of tests but they certainly have got a uh, proof of principle based on the um, the biochemistry and the biophysics. Oh, right. No, they can yeah. totally make it. I guess this is the thing with the biofuels that I always come back to is, you know, these are really amazing and we can make a whole bunch of variations, but what are we feeding the bacteria to do this and what is their production rate? Because I think right. these guys are being fed sucrose in the R5 and how much in that, where is that coming from? How are we making that? Are we Probably from corn. From corn, which is getting fossil <laughs> yep. fuels. Yeah. I mean, it's a, I, I love the idea of biofuels, but yep. you know, that's the, it's no, just your, your cool points well taken. And they, they definitely address those issues in the discussion. Um, so they're not trying to say. Um, yeah. You know, no, I know. Done. They do a good job of it. And, and they have patented this. Um, but also, I was really encouraged in looking which I don't usually do, looking at the acknowledgements um, to see what a collaborative group this is and how many different um, institutions, national labs, academic labs, they've pulled together. So if you'll in- humor me here, um, this is a project led by our Department of Energy Joint Bioenergy Institute and also um, Office of Science, Office of Biological and Environmental Research, and also a the Co-Optimization of Fuels and Engines Project, sponsored by the Department of Energy. And they're collaborating with um, the Vehicle Technologies Office, which is a collaboration between our Department of Energy and the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And also, some of the work was done at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is a uh, collaborative project of multiple national labs that was initiated to accelerate the introduction of affordable, scalable, and sustainable biofuels and high-efficiency, low-emission vehicle engines. So they've got funding from um, Department of Energy um, under a contract with um, another group. So um, I'm really encouraged to know that we've got some of the greatest minds, um, not only in microbiology and genetic engineering, but also in energy and in um, Department of Energy, which has national interest in um, developing new clean uh, fuels to make us um, energy independent, but also um, to protect the environment in the process. And if you recall that fusion story, you you might remember that the head of the National Nuclear Security Administration was talking about generating 1.5 joules of energy from the fusion experiment, but this one is generating megajoules of energy per liter. And um, I, I just point that out because I don't think it. we need to be funding these things as well as high energy physics. So it's just my soapbox for the day. Yeah as well as um, drilling in pristine 
um, oh, the Arctic. Yes. <laughs> so, how long will it take for them to get scale here? Do we have any sense? They don't talk about it at all. But is this yeah, ten years, the, fifty years, a hundred years? This is far enough out of my realm that I do not know the answer to that. Michelle's. Uh, what I did is I'll put into the show notes uh, two papers that people may find interesting. The the first is the um, evolution of polyketide synthetases in bacteria, which talks about, and and we've used these polyketide uh, microbial manufacturing facilities to make all sorts of antibiotics. The pharmaceutical industry is well suited for doing this polyketide type of work. So it's probably going to be big pharma repurposing some of its efforts to do this. And so I dropped that into the show notes so you can read about that. Also, I dumped into the show notes um, an interesting perspective uh, paper. It's a mini review by Maureen O'Malley and David Walsh entitled Rethinking Microbial Infallibility in the Metagenomics Era. And the one line out of their abstract is most telling in in that, and if you bear with me, I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, the principle of microbial infallibility asserts that wherever there's an energetic gain to be made from environmental resources, microorganisms will find a way to take advantage of the situation. Hmm. Now, this was a claim made back in the 50s by um, – one of the early pioneers of antibiotics, Ernst Gale, out of uh, Cambridge, I believe, or was it Oxford? I always get the two confused, and I apologize to, to him for screwing that up. But it's really uh, two neat papers for you to consider as you're reading about this jet fuel. Very cool. Yeah, very, it is very, very cool. cool. I Love hope it. we can... I hope we can get somewhere with this because people have been working on this. I mean, at my university at Michigan, I'm sure all over for about 20 years and we seem to be good at making a little bit of it, but yeah. how to scale up in a way that doesn't use fossil fuels to make the things that feed the bacteria is that's the, I think the next big problem. Very cool. Thank, thank you, Michelle. My pleasure. Uh, now, Michael, a little something down to earth. <laughs> we're, we're we're going completely different. We're we're going to the clinical side of uh, diagnostic microbiology, and the paper is entitled "Nanopore Targeted Sequencing Improves the Diagnosis and Treatments of Patients with Serious Infections." And this is a paper that appeared in MBio uh, on 18 January 2023. And it's by Zhang, Lu, Tang, Sha, and Hu. And they're at the Institute of Hematology, the Union Hospital at Wai Tong University Science and Technology in Wuhan, China. And the first author, Zhang, and the second author, Lu, contributed equally to this work. And the author order was determined by drawing straws. And Tang and Sha contributed as well equally to the work, and they are the co-corresponding authors. Now, this paper is a bit different in that it sets out to investigate the use of a specific molecular technique, namely targeted metagenomic sequencing that they referred to as NTS, after the nanopore sequencing technology that they're using to determine the sequence of the microbes that they are discovering. And they are effectively looking at an essential gene having sufficient molecular diversity such that the information gained from its sequencing of this targeted gene upon comparison of its sequence against a reference database will allow the discrimination of the microbes at the level of the species. And we know that gene to be the 16S ribosomal RNA gene in the case of bacteria. And they also have two other sentinel genes, namely uh, the intergenic region from, from the fungi that allows them to look at the spacer region to identify fungi, as well as the RPO gene. 
in uh, mycobacterial species to discriminate tuberculosis from other MTBs. And that's a much better defining gene for that particular genus. And um, the results from this study and others like it, and the literature is exploding in China, exploiting these molecular techniques. The United States and the developed world are slow to move from the field of diagnostic microbiology where it's been tube and plate for literally over 150 years to one where there is a greater to almost a sole reliance on the use of these molecular taxonomic approaches in order to develop the information to be used to make informed identifications to first diagnose the patients with serious infections and then hopefully improve their outcomes once you discover who's there in the infected site or the infected blood and then uh, effectively adjust your antimicrobial cocktail based on the sensitivity of what antibiotics will likely work against members found in that particular, if you will, clinical uh, community. And so it gives the clinical community then an opportunity to quickly refine their empiric antibiotic prescribing decisions, thereby facilitating antibiotic stewardship, a very important and worthy goal. And this other one is really selfish from the perspective of taxpayers who are paying for health, namely hopefully lower the cost with, again, superior outcomes being the ultimate goal. Now, we know the cost of DNA sequencing has gone more negative than the negative slope we normally associated with the cost of computing as defined by Moore's Law which many of you know was pr proposed or attributed to Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, who in 1965, when he posited that roughly every two years, the number of transistors on microchips would double, resulting in computational dividends of significantly faster, smaller, and more efficient computers with time. And I'll also put into the show notes uh, a graph because the NIH, not wanting to be left out of this party, uh, has used the Moore's Law graph to actually highlight how the genomics area that was ushered in with the advent of the Human Genome Project that was initiated just a short while ago by Francis Collins and the NIH, and they recently posted this a piece on their um, website of the cost of sequencing a human genome. And in their graphic, they display the negative slope of the cost of sequencing is even more impressively negative than Moore's law when they're contrasting the cost of sequencing versus the considering the cost of computation. And so much of the cost savings in sequencing the human genome have been reduced through realization of improvements in the bioinformatic assembly and the deconvolution software that has been developed to do this in concert with uh, the metagenomic process that we have with devices like nanopore sequencing. And many of you in the lab will be familiar with Illumina sequencing by synthesis process and then through the alignment process, contrasting it against a reference sequence. Again, another DOE-sponsored service that eventually went over to NSF. The 16S ribosomal RNA uh, database was, um, you know, GenBank was originally DOE, and then it became NSF, and then uh, NIH ultimately. So again, when you look at the universality of science. We don't care where the money comes from. We, we just want to get the science done. And to illustrate, and for those of you not familiar with nanopore sequencing, I also placed into the show notes an approximate four minute and 30 second video of how nanopore sequencing works. It's a really cute YouTube video. If you have the time, I commend it to you. It really explains it, it quite well in a in a striking British accent, so you know it must be good. And um, principally, the key, what our the key here is it's miniaturized, right? So it's yes, 
cheap, very fast. Cheap, fast, and uh, to sort of short circuit this, they can identify the microbe that's associated with a blood sample or many microbes in a blood sample in as little as six hours. As little as six hours. Is that and compared with, to culture methods, Michael? Well, culture methods take uh, 24 to 48 hours. What about took, mass spec? Mass spec takes 24 hours to grow the culture, and uh. then you have to put it on the mass spec. And so that'll generally take another couple of hours. Okay. And God forbid you have an anaerobe or any fastidious microorganism. And many of the infections we're going to describe today involve fastidious microorganisms, many of which are anaerobes, some of which are fungi, and fungi take even longer to grow. Mm. And so that really extends the window for the diagnostician who's trying to refine your antibiotic therapy to prevent you from getting sicker because, you know, the the sooner you get the right antibiotic to the infection, the more likely it's going to arrest the growth of the microbe and then arrest the infectious process and the pathology that's developing. So again, principally, they've optimized their process described for the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And their technique offers them to opportunity to detect um, microbes within this six-hour window. And they're using the internal transcribed spacer region to identify fungi and the RPOB gene from mycobacteria, which you recall encodes the beta subunit of the bacterial RNA polymerase, which codes for a very big protein, 1,342 amino acids. So there's a lot of information in that sequence of, of DNA. And nanopore sequencing doesn't care if you're looking at RNA or DNA. It'll sequence both without any problem. So, so do they explain why they pick RPOG? I mean, these, like, what you pick to look it's, at it. It's been or what RPOB. Mycobacteria. It's, just it's what standard. the mycobacteriologists have decided as one of their canonical genes that they use to identify this organism. They're, they give references to it. So it's well known amongst the mycobacteriologists why RPOG, RPOG, <laughs> if I can sell it, uh, I'll get it out. Um, Sue Dorman at my institution works on uh, mycobacteria and she's always talking about it. So Okay. Yeah, no, because, you know, when you pick a molecular clock or molecular identifier, there's usually a good. So this is just there's a, a good reason for. Yeah. Great. And the mycobacterial world is pretty diverse. I mean, you have, in addition to tuberculosis, you have avium intracellulariae. You have some of the other fast-growing mycobacteria like Chelone and Fortuitum and others that are significantly involved in uh, infections. Now, let's get to their trial. Now, this was a clinical trial. It was a rather small trial, small study. They started with 53 patients. Three were dropped out simply because they didn't have enough information. 27 were men and 23 were women. And all of the patients were suffering from blood diseases, ranging from acute lymphoblastic leukemia all the way out to multiple myelomas and lymphomas and, and other things. So these people... Uh, that have these blood disorders, as you well know, are typically immune suppressed because their blood isn't normal. So their immune systems are, are struggling. And in addition, most of the patients that were sampled were at the time of their hemopoietic stem cell transplantation, where they're going to be treated with either an ablation form of therapy to get rid of their bone marrow in order to effectively ensure that the hemopoietic stem cell graft actually takes. And they abbreviate hemopoietic stem cell transplantation throughout their paper as HSCT. They're immunocompromised in, a, in yes. major ways and, and at serious risk for a range of infections. And a significant fraction were also on glucocorticoids, 84%, and 78% of the patients in their study were on immunosuppressant agents. And so we know 
that that predisposes them to any sort of infection, even our normal floral organisms can invade and cause uh, significant disease. So what they did in their first set of experiments is they compared this NTS, or I'm just going to call it targeted metagenomic sequencing, because they're looking for specific targets. So they call it NTS, but that's sort of advertising nanopore sequencing, but so I just was calling it TMS. Um, that's effectively what folks like Robin Patel, who's in the diagnostic world, refer to this targeted metagenomic sequencing. That's how she refers to it, not to bias selection of a method over one or the other. So the data for their comparison of effectiveness, and again, they looked at this targeted metagenomics versus blood culture and anal swabs. And what they found, it's all shown to us in the second table. And it's nice that it's a small study because they give us the results from all 50 of the patients. So I found that to be very useful for looking at the utility of this technique and helping inform me as to whether or not molecular diagnostics has value in a clinical scenario. Normally, in the past, molecular, you had to mail it off to somebody. It took a month of Sundays to get the data back. And the patient was either alive and well or dead and buried before you got the data back. And so this, because they're getting it back so soon, they were really able to um, you know, make informed choices about how to treat the patient. Now, what did the data say? The positivity rate, which they defined as detecting a microbial signal, was highest for the TMS or the targeted metagenomic sequencing, followed by blood culture, which was only 32.6%. That's so a we huge have difference. 90% versus 32. Yeah. And the anal swabs was only 14%. So that mm-hmm. really is night and day. But appreciate that two of the methods were asking the microbes to grow. So they have to have the perfect method to have the right media at the right time, the right incubation period, the proper mixture of gases. And of course, the ugly elephant in the room is whether or not the microbes that they recovered from the patient specimen, namely the blood, were in a VB and C state, viable but non-culturable, or whether or not there were any inhibitors present to the culture process. And now I know some of you are out there wondering, You can. we've all seen CSI and you can figure out who's there just from nucleic acid, but mm-hmm. nucleic acid recovered for this TMS assay, it's not likely from circulating dead bacteria because I have done enough reading over the last few years that have shown multiple experiments show injected non-viable bacteria or cell-free DNA is not detectable from patient specimens from a live patient in samples after about 24 to 48 hours. And further, we know how uh, unstable ribosomal RNA is uh, when it's circulating and DNA from non-viable bacteria is often been reported as associated with incomplete or low quality sequence reads that are generally screened out uh, during the bioinformatics processes associated with many TMS processes. So we other than the other advantage of TMS is multiple microbes can be detected. Remember, most of the media are just looking for one particular microbe because it's either a selective and differential media or you have the gas mixture adjusted to grow a particular microbe. Here it's blood where they uh, offered to us, they had a maximum number of sequencing reads of 62,120 and a minimum number of reads of 21. So that means they saw the microbe at least 21 times in their sequence reads, whereas traditional blood culture methods and anal swabs were aim- only able to c- recover one or two pathogens, again, without an ability to offer even how many 
were associated with that patient specimen. Remember, culture just scores plus or minus. It's there or it's not. The other data element they offered from the results associated with that second table was whether the anti-infective strategy originally empirically designed at day zero, if they altered it, did that empiric course of anti-infectives based on a transition of the TMS result uh, alter the clinical outcome? And their answer was yes. The anti-infective strategy was altered for most of the patients with the effectiveness being reported in, in the same table. And it's, again, reported as a binary yes or no. Did the technique help or hurt? But if I'm and, reading the data correctly, it's 93% of the patients benefited from having their antibiotic treatment changed based on the sequencing data. Right. And when you look at the no's, and I'll just talk about one of the no's, um, this was patient number nine, if you're following along in this open access paper. The microbes that they recovered, they recovered true. One was a strict anaerobe, abiotrophia defecta, <laughs> which is a rare but critical cause of infective endocarditis, which you can think of abiotrophia as a nutritionally deficient streptococci that traditionally cannot be cultured on routine culture media. And a fungus, Codamia, an emerging pathogen previously known as Pichia, which is a fungus belonging to the Saccharomyces family. And it's an emerging pathogen in China. And again, if you're interested in learning more about Codamia, um, I I put a, a, a reference into the show notes for you. You can see that the antibiotic that they opted for to treat the codamia was amphotericin B, which the clinicians around here call amphoterable, and caspofungin. But but they did not offer any antibiotics for the abiotrophia, likely owing to the small number of reads. They only saw 228 reads of abiotrophia, and they saw many, many more reads of the Codamia. So they were obviously thinking it's probably a fungus that's affecting this. And either the antimicrobials that they use to treat the fungus, the caspofungin or the amphotericin, didn't work against uh, Codamia. And it's, again, an emerging pathogen. Yes, Michelle? When I look at this, um, there are a lot of microbes listed here that I've I've never heard of, not even the (laughs) genus. And so the method is incredibly sensitive, so that's great. It's identifying the um, whole community that's growing in the in the blood samples, but um, it's still going to be important for the healthcare workers um, to rely on their knowledge and their experience to um, surmise what might be the actual culprit in this particular infection and 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 where to um, focus then the antibiotic treatment. Is that right? That is correct. And that's one of the great limitations of their study. Michelle nails it again, because we don't know who is the bad actor yeah. in the sense of postulates have not been applied here. <laughs> yeah. Coke's postulates have yeah. not been fulfilled. We don't know who the bad actor is. And this is the call to action for the clinical microbiology world. We have to take this technology that is extremely sensitive and begin to figure out what it means. There are a number of companies out there already um, talking about the microbes that they can recover from blood, the microbes they can recover from other specimens. And what we really need are good randomized clinical trials that are effectively going to answer Michelle's question is this microbe and the treatment of this microbe, will it resolve the infection for their better? Now, they get to that in some sense as they take us through more of their data. They show that the antibiotics were adjusted for 37 patients, which is 74% of their population after the results from the TMS, and no adjustment was made for six uh, patients or 12% because the bacteria detected were sensitive to the previously administered antibiotic. And 
again, I guess you're killing all comers. Now, and if do you, they know that formally? I mean, in this particular they patient, don't. it could be a resistant strain, bad luck, right? It could be. Did they read? They did not. Yeah, so they don't know. They're just seeing stuff, and it's so sensitive. They don't have any idea. I don't know what the read number means. I mean, more reads means it's more abundant. Mm-hmm. Yes, it means it's more abundant, but you don't know the significance of the abundance. It, right. Remember, these are hemopoietic stem cell patients. You don't know if the barriers in their gut have broken down and all the anaerobes have leached across the barrier. But Michael, right. why do we know that it's something you culture is the causative agent, not something that didn't culture? True. True. Well, because um, as Michelle pointed out, Cox postulates, you recover the microbe from the blood of the animal, you inject it in the animal, the no, animal but, but dies. We don't do that with humans. You go in a hospital, no. you get a culture and they say, aha, this is what we're going to treat. And most of the time they got it, right? So why is that? It's a 150-year-old technology, Vincent, and it's the, <laughs> always the way it's been done is the short answer and the simplest answer to that question. They, they go on in the so remainder. So it must be, of, Michael, I'm sorry. It must be that what grows out is, is the, the majority of what's in there. And when, when we do the, the NGS, maybe we need to take the one with more reads, and that would do it. Well, we don't know that definitively either. Well, you need a trial for that. I agree. You, you, you need a trial for that. Okay. And – What they point out in the last remaining data elements of their paper is, as you might expect, infection is a substantial risk to patients who are undergoing hemopoietic stem cell transfer. Uh, In fact, in a seven-year study, they reported on the cumulative response rate to antimicrobial therapy was 66.9% in hemopoietic stem cell patients. And the risk of dying from infection was 11.2% after allo transplantation and only 0.8% after autotransplantation. At the same time, the uh, mortality rate here was 2.9% uh, in, in their particular study for the seven-year period, which is nine out of three mm. 104, and it decreased to zero deaths after they began to use this NTS. Now, granted, it's not a very big N because they only had 50 patients in this study. And again, so more work uh, needs to be done. But well, again, if I could, if I could interject, what's curious yeah, is they um, cite multiple times in their paper reference 13 look at reference 13. That's where the methods are. That's where the methods are. So this is a preprint that was posted in April of 2020 by um, a different group, different institutions in Wuhan who um, pioneered this method. And they, in their preprint, looked at 1,257 patients. And they also provide a really nice schematic of their flow and how they've designed their um, primers in order to amplify the DNA from in order to get a variety of species within that particular genus. So they're not using just a forward and a reverse primer. They're using pools of forward primers mm-hmm. and reverse primers so that they can try to cover the, the diversity that we know is out there and certainly is in these patients <laughs> based on their yeah. the data here. And, and the other thing that they go into in this paper is they use other clinical markers to answer I I guess the clinical question, are the patients getting better? And they are looking at things like um, body temperature. So, you know, do you stop making a fever? They're looking at C-reactive protein and procalcitonin. And, you know, procalcitonin uh, is a marker on our cells. It's normally very low in blood, and if you have a serious bacterial infection, and this has been demonstrated in multiple papers, the cells in many parts of your body, when you have an infection, will release large amounts of procalcitonin, and it's normally a routine clinical assay that you can order to figure out if a patient has an acute infection. And, you know, they report that all of these clinical markers that they're looking at, in addition to the white blood cell count, the neutrophil granulocyte count, the hemoglobin numbers, and the platinum counts, they look at it at day zero and then the seventh day after the adjustment for the antibiotics. And again, 
the mean temperature, the CRP, the procalcitronin, all of the markers that I just rattled off are much better after seven days of the adjusted TMS antibiotic cocktail. And uh, so they're making the argument that it can inform a clinical decision to generate a better outcome. But as Michelle says, we, we have to uh, begin to look at this very carefully because, you know, uh, hemopoietic stem cell patients have been um, very challenging uh, to deal with because they're on bone marrow suppression, they're on graft versus host disease drugs, and there's overwhelming evidence from case reports in the literature that the risk of st- severe infection is still present and may even lead to the graft failure subsequent to the hemopoietic stem cell transplant. In fact, they offer more evidence from the literature that between 30 to 80% of the patients undergoing um, this HSCT develop bacterial, fungal, or viral infections. And they offer us uh, arguments that they can begin to look for viral infections in addition to looking at the bacterial and fungi that they're beginning to to characterize. And could they also do another round and screen for antibiotic resistance genes so that they, they most certainly can. Yep. And there's Couple papers in that. the literature that actually are looking for the resistome. And we've covered some of those already on, on TWIM. And so, you know, summing it up at the end, this is a really fascinating paper that has some limitation. It also provides a basis or an argument for the use of the emergence of these faster, more sensitive, and more acute pathogen detection technologies going forward in the clinic. But at the same time, the clinicians have to be able to, if you will, discriminate the forest from the tree. They have to know who the bad actors Mm -hmm. are most likely going to be. And we just don't have enough trial data out there. But with each successive issue of the journals coming out, we're seeing more and more clinical trials advancing the use of these molecular techniques as leading to superior outcomes. Now, outcome studies are expensive to do because if you're going back to the gold standard of uh, culture and it's going to take you two weeks to get a, a, a change of plan, it's making the argument you've got to do coincident culture, and molecular methods in these trials to figure out which one is actually going to be better. It's not your traditional inferiority trial where you you can, you know, do culture and wait and see, and then you do the molecular if all, all the cultures fail. I think we have enough evidence out there about V, B, and C that um, we really don't know you know, what's going on, especially if all the culture data are negative, like we saw with the anal culture only being 14% positive in these patients that indeed did have infections, because there was not one in the 50 that didn't have some microbial. Um, but I guess the sig- question really is, they all have microbes. Most, yeah. many of these microbes though, are not ones that we know to cause disease. I don't know what the breakdown is, but the question is, like, if you just had done this on people who were treated and then sampled, you know, when they have infection and sampled, you know, early on before they have infection, will you pick up some of these before, you know, how many of these are just incidental? Maybe we need to go and look at study number 13. I didn't bring up study 13 because it's not been published yet. But it's almost three years and it hasn't been published. So this actually- Well, there's been, there's been covid and it's well, in Wuhan. But, and it's in Wuhan. Yeah, yeah but, but so is this Embio paper that got published. That's true. Even though it's absolutely dependent on this not yet peer-reviewed or, or not yet accepted. I mean, so the question is, like, how many things cause, how many bacterial infections, I guess, actually lead to a bad disease outcome? And why haven't we noticed them before? So I, I actually just put in the chat this one that's actually an older one on the Virium. It's a metagenomic study. And they looked at kids with fevers and they found viruses in many cases, even though there was no diagnostic for it. 
And so I guess the question though is, if, you know, it's different with a viral infection, you're just gonna get a, a response. But to my question is like, how many of these are incidental and how many of these are actually associated? Mm-hmm. And there's no way to tell. Yeah. And that's, I think, a big, I mean, you can see stuff, yeah. That's the workshop that the academy has to hold. The American Academy for Microbiology needs to begin to convene a workshop to fundamentally ask these sorts of questions. Because well, to advocate these, for funding to, to do what, as you said, are really yeah. expensive studies. No, I, I know they're they're really expensive, but I think the molecular technology is maturing very, very quickly. It's it's sort of eclipsing our ability to understand the fundamental pathogenesis of these organisms that we've never heard of before, whether or not they are indeed. Now, granted, many of them we could never grow. Right, but many but, of them may never cause disease, and we can't separate yeah. out. You know, well, abiotrophia it, does indeed cause disease. So then that's in one a, out of the In many. certain patients. In certain yeah. patients. Michael, how does uh, Robin Patel feel about this? Um, she's... She just published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine where she reviewed periprosthetic joint infections, where she describes this, uh, not nanopore, but targeted metagenomic sequencing. Mm. And I had read that before I stumbled into this paper. And she she talks about that. She's she talks about, um, you know, see uh, culture failures and then the targeted metagenomic sequencing revealing what was there. Yeah. But she makes the argument we have to do more studies. Yeah. It seems to me that at some point this will replace most of the other approaches. Yeah. Well, look what's what happened with um, the Malditoff. Malditoff yeah. has replaced much of the traditional uh, chemistry mm-hmm. because of its uh, value and its utility and speed. And unbiased. And unbiased. and unbiased approach, yeah. One of the things that I find really interesting about these that I heard here, because we, I probably got five years ago, got WashuMed or the hospital system associated with WashuMed, got a new setup for doing cult- sort of traditional cultures to test for what's growing. And and it ha- it takes 18 hours, I think, or less time than it used to take. But the problem is that didn't match the shift changes. Mm. And so there was still a delay, even though you could do it faster, the way the whole system was working to test and then prescribe was based on the shift changes with the attendings or the, the doctors and so and who was calling it in. And so there are all these other interesting things that happen when you change how these go in the workload. You got to integrate it with electronic medical records. and. <laughs> oh, yes. It, it, it's basically – it, and, and that's why I wanted to talk about it because I'm struggling with what we need to be teaching to med students. I mean, do they need to worry about triple sugar iron auger <laughs> and <laughs> – uh, these other esoteric media that have a way of showing classic, up on classic media. Well, if they're on a Cla- if they're on a report, Michael, they have to know what it means, right? No, they the reports they see today typically give them the genus and the species. Oh, then, because then they don't most need of to them know. Are it. using Malditoff. Yeah. Well, then they don't need they to know need it. To then. Know? Yeah, they just need to know what the outcome is, right? Do they yeah. need yes. to know how? It yep. would be nice if they knew how. Eh. But again, the arguments made, some of them are going to go to under-resourced communities and under-resourced nations where they may not have Mm -hmm. access to such technology and they may have to go back to the uh, ways we used to do things. Wow. Interesting. It's it's a conundrum. Very very interesting. Well, it's a good problem to have because technology is good to have. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Whether it's for fuels, (laughs) biosynthetic fuels, or (laughs) better diagnostics. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Now you're welcome. That's TWIM 281. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIM. You can send us questions or comments, TWIM at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, consider supporting Microbe TV, which is a nonprofit organization. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent. And Petra Levin is at Washington University in St. Louis. Thank you, Petra. Thank you. 
I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.